Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they worked so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. More information is at FarmBureauAdvantage.com. The Remarkable Soybean. From its oil, we get products like ink, candles, and paint. From its meal, we get a high-protein fiber used in foods and animal feeds. Natural soy is replacing chemicals and products you use every day. You can learn more about soybeans at VASoybean.com. With the average Virginia farmer getting older and grayer each year, there's a noticeable distance between the average millennial and the average farmer. What do farmers know about millennials? What should they know? That'll be our focus on Ag Insights later in the program. We also have a story on the importance of forestry in the Old Dominion. Many people don't realize we have 15 million acres of forest in Virginia. Plus, we'll have some tips on controlling weeds in your lawn. Those stories and more on this episode of Virginia Farming. I'm Jeff Ishin. Virginia's timber industry has been around since the colony was founded in 1607. Trees and forest products, however, continue to be important in the 21st century, as we learn in this feature report from Dave Miller. One of the very first natural resources to be harvested and exported from the Virginia colony were hardwood trees for ships, masts, posts and beams, and hardwood flooring. Today, timber is treated as a long-term crop across rural Virginia. The timber industry is worth $21 billion to the overall state's economy, with more than 31,323 manufacturing jobs. The timber industry encompasses everything from construction lumber to hardwood floors to furniture to pallets for shipping and pellets for wood stoves. Hardwood lumber is one of Virginia's top agricultural exports to countries like China. Timber is a very important commodity here in Virginia, really very important. Again, it's the third largest contributor to our economy, and the products that we uh, come from Virginia are amazing. Uh, we have products that go into our homes as dimensional lumber, and we have products that go into our paper products and pulp. We have plywood and OSB, pellets for the uh, energy sector. So it is an amazing resource that is renewable and natural and has a sustainability so long as our landowners take place or continue to reforest and use those, uh, their land for sustainable forestry practices. Timber is grown and harvested throughout Virginia, even near urban areas. There are more hardwood trees than pine trees grown in the Old Dominion, especially in the northern part of the state. Pine plantations for softwood products are more common in southern Virginia. About 62% of Virginia is forest land, and private landowners control almost 80% of all timber resources. Most of those timber owners replant their trees once they're harvested. Well, pine is 35 to 40 years what they're cutting now. You, know, you can't tell, but the stands right behind me, that stand there is 22 years old, and I thinned that. And the stand behind that, I clear cut 27 years ago, and I thinned that. So it's coming all back around, you know, so I'm just rotating around and trying to keep busy. But just goes to show, though, that if you replant, you can have this again in a certain number of years, and, and that's a good thing. Carter Flippo grew up working in one of the almost 600 sawmills here in Virginia. His family processes lumber from the weigh-in trucks all the way through the drying and the planer machines. They send a majority of their lumber to treatment plants to the south. Some of that lumber comes back to Virginia home centers like Home Depot and Lowe's. Flippo lumber deals almost exclusively with pine. A decade ago, at the peak of the housing market, there were close to 52,000 jobs at Virginia lumber mills. We started off years ago just in the rough green lumber business. Uh, putting, you know, put, I always say put them in round, hope they come out square. Um, but as time went on, we realized we couldn't really stay in business doing that. So slowly we got into drying lumber and dressing lumber. And then back through the 90s, we built, upgraded just about everything around here. And now we're in the finished lumber business. And uh, we make everything from 
one by fours like you see here. Uh, it's a small part of our business. Main, main, main thing we do is two inch lumber, dimension lumber, two by four through two by 10. We make some five quarter by six decking um, timbers, four by fours, four by sixes, six by sixes. Sawmills and wood processing companies have different customers for the different types of wood they process. David Knighton Sawmill deals with hardwoods and produces lumber for a variety of products from oak furniture to low-grade pallets and packing materials. To stay in business, no lumber is wasted in modern sawmills. Everything from the bark to the shavings is sold for use in products we all use. Wood pellets are sold to the electrical power industry as part of the federal clean and renewable energy programs. We buy the timber, we log it ourselves, we bring it to our mill here. Um, and then we, after we unload, we process it, run it through the sawmill, and then once it comes out in, into the uh, boards, then that's when we grade it to determine whether it's higher quality for the furniture industry or what have you, or whether it's lower quality for industrial grade. I guess I'm second generation. My son just started uh, about a year and a half ago, so he'll be third generation, and he's, uh, he enjoys it. He's, um, he likes it a lot, so I, I think just the, the, the passing down, I guess, from generation to generation is what I really love about it. The families that work in Virginia's timber industry are carrying on the tradition of processing the almost $336 million worth of timber harvested every year. With their help, Virginia's 15.8 million acres of forest lands are growing and flourishing across the state while providing valuable sources of income for rural Virginians. In Caroline County, Virginia, this is Dave Miller. Thank you, Dave, for that report. Well, many of you may not know that the world record for corn yield is held by a Virginia farmer. Norm Hyde shares the, the story from Charles City County. David Hula is a corn warrior. He not only grows some of the best quality field corn in the United States, he holds the world record of 542 bushels per acre yield. That's more corn per acre than is produced by the fertile soils of the American Midwest. His secret is simple. Learn from your mistakes and don't be afraid to try something new. Hula is currently in the middle of filming season two of Corn Warriors, a reality TV show that airs on the RFD network. Well, there was the concept of let's have a corn show talk be a little bit informative and then have a little bit of drama you know when you get into these reality shows they want drama I don't know a farmer around that wants drama we want things to go smooth so we were introduced to this concept and you know I was hesitant at first but then when they talked about education I'm like sure you know and because of their success they thought we could draw a portion of the audience and then when they started pulling some of the other growers from some of the Midwest, and then they had a guy in um, Colorado, and now they have a fellow in Georgia. So we got a wide, diverse group of growers, and then it's kind of had this little competition, who could have the highest yield? Well, fortunately, in season one, you know, we had the best yield. You can see we look like we had pretty good grain fill. Um, you know, with this particular hybrid was planted in the first part of May because uh, we had a wet spring so we kind of got delayed planting so we came back but we got good pollination on the you know we can see that on the length of the year we got decent girth around uh, we this is probably about 16 rows around and if you notice we had good pretty good grain fill because you don't see a whole lot of dent going on here and then as we can see that we cracked the corn we kind of got some deep kernels so we're expecting some pretty good things out of this particular hybrid this year, uh, despite some of the weather challenges we had. Hula says his favorite hobby is playing in the dirt, and he loves learning how to improve his crops and yields in the field. Hula says a combine that costs upwards of half a million dollars can actually be a bargain because of all the work it can do. And now we're running a John Deere S770. One of the neat things is it's got auto steer, read the yields on the go. So technology is just awesome. So we used to have to take the grain head off or the corn head off when we went from farm to farm. Now, with the convenience of this, we're able to fold it up and unfold it and 
never take it off till the end of the season. What's it like to record a reality TV show while trying to put in a full 100% day's work in the field? Hula says it takes patience and don't always expect to get everything done on your list. He often balances working in the field with accommodating the film crews, trying to get things done. When the film crew comes out, you know, they, ha they say, we're not going to get in your way. Well, if you have so many things you want to get done, you cut that down into 25%. That's about all you'll get accomplished. Because you, you have GoPros mounted in the cab. you got GoPros mounted on the planter, or the sprayer boom, on the harvester. And then you have somebody riding in the cab. And you know, you got a, you got, you're mic'd up. And then somebody following you all the way around. And you know, as a grower, when we have to stop and get out of a cab, it's usually because we either have to fill up, we got a problem, or we're going to do something else. So when you got somebody else in the cab, you got to let them get out first. So it just kind of slows the whole process up. Working with a film crew may slow Hewlett down, but not much. And he knows that one result of being on television is that viewers can at least get a small feel for what it takes to raise a record corn crop. And maybe one day Hewlett will get his own star in Hollywood. In Charles City County, I'm Norm Hyde. Thank you, Norm, for that report. This week, we welcome to our show Morgan Slavin, a young woman who is very involved in Virginia agriculture. We'll be discussing the relationship between Virginia farmers and millennials. That conversation is coming up next during Ag Insights. Hello everybody, Jeff Ishy here with Virginia Farming. It's my pleasure to welcome back to our program. You were with us several weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Morgan Slavin, uh, you're from here in Weirs Cay, Virginia in the beautiful Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. A very historic spot mm -hmm. for Virginia agriculture and, and organizations that you've been involved with. But tell us more about yourself. One of the things I want to talk about today with Morgan, she is in her mid twenties. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about millennials and agriculture. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to have some interesting... <laughs> I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, there's a lot of things that can be said, but mm -hmm. tell us about Morgan Slavin. Sure. Well, uh, the first thing I always tell folks is I'm proud to be uh, part of a family farming operation here in Weir's Cave. Uh, my siblings and I are the sixth generation to uh, live and work on our family farm, and that's something I'm very proud of. Um, but I currently have a nine-to-five job with the Virginia Foundation for Agriculture in the Classroom as a development associate, but definitely very passionate about agricultural advocacy, agricultural literacy, um, and, and bridging the gap between producer and consumer. You also have experience with Farm Bureau, I believe. I do. And uh, with a, a, you were a state officer with mm -hmm. FFA. I was. So <laughs> lots of, I used to do some program work with uh, American Farm Bureau with the Young Farmer and Rancher Program uh, in rural development. And then also was on state staff after I was a state FFA officer, was a state coordinator for the FFA officer team for several years. So I love that program development work too. Ooh, very involved in Virginia agriculture and we certainly appreciate everything you do Morgan. All right, millennials and agriculture. A lot of us old fogies, <laughs> we're, we're trying to figure this out, but mm -hmm. maybe you can help us. Uh, there's a generation age, I don't know, 18 to, to mid 30s or so, mm -hmm. and we, we are trying to understand from a couple of different perspectives mm -hmm. about millennials and agriculture. Mm -hmm. I think most of us are we're concerned about the future of agriculture and where is it going to go from here. The average Virginia farmer is 58 years old. Mm -hmm. That's my age. I'm 58 years mm -hmm. old. So what is Virginia agriculture going to look like 30 years from now mm -hmm. when you're in your... <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's broach this from a couple of different perspectives. First mm -hmm. of all, the consumer perspective. Yes. What impact has the millennial had on agriculture from the consumer perspective. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I, the first thing that comes to my mind when you ask that question is I remember sitting in a common space area uh, my freshman year at Virginia Tech and the common book that year was Animal Vegetable Miracle and it talked about uh, locally sourcing food and this family who actually I believe resided in southwest Virginia um, only got their food, source their food, from within, I think, maybe 100 miles or something. Mm -hmm. So uh, I remember sitting in my room and overhearing one of my peers out in the common space say, you guys, after I read this common book, you, we can't eat the potatoes at D2. 
And I said, what in the world? So I go out and I, and I listened in on the conversation. She said, the potatoes are from Idaho. And the book said you can only get food from with 100 miles. Mm. She said this while holding a Starbucks cup. <laughs> and I'm not really sure if cocoa beans and sugar are sourced within 100 miles of Blacksburg. But with that being said, um, I believe millennials, especially now that we're um, getting into the consumer world, we're making purchasing decisions in the grocery store, uh, you know, we're finding and sourcing our own information. I think con consumers, especially in the millennial age, are most interested in getting their information firsthand. And whereas I think other generations have <coughs> referred to the news or did their own research, a lot of times they're getting, millennials are getting peer recommendations. You see all yeah. the time on Facebook, those, those asks. It is truly a different age because when I was your age, mm -hmm. it was all about TV dinners mm -hmm. and convenience yes. and microwave ovens mm -hmm. and whoever read a label on a food product, <laughs> exactly. who, who cared where it came from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but now people really want to know not only where it came from, but mm -hmm. they want to know exactly how it was produced. Yes. Why? Um, I think a lot of it comes uh, from especially the idea of uh, environmental impact. Um, a lot of m millennials are more aware about their place in society and maybe how they influence the people around them, the, the world around them. So I think that, th and this is my perspective, that a lot of consumer millennials are out there wondering, <clears throat> okay, I wanna know exactly who's producing my food. I wanna make sure I'm supporting somebody locally, my money's being used the right way. Um, and also to make sure that they can be guilt-free when they go, when they go to eat. Guilt-free. That's interesting. They want to have a conscience. They yes. have a conscience. Mm -hmm. I see that's in to totally alien to <laughs> to my generation. Mm -hmm. You went through the drive-through and you could care less as long as it was under a dollar. You exactly. bought it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, that that's very interesting. Of course, we have seen a lot of trends with mm -hmm. this buy local, the farm to table movement. Yes. I haven't been inside a university cafeteria in mm -hmm. a long, long time, mm -hmm. but I suspect it looks dramatically different from when I was in college. Oh yes, At, again, that year, um, it became a big push to want to have this locally sourced food. And uh, I believe now Virginia Tech is utilizing a lot of their own livestock, um, beef products, some of the uh, on-farm or on-university raised uh, products in the cafeterias now. Yeah. Well, it's all about change and mm -hmm. people accepting change. You know, there's an old pearl of wisdom that says uh, the only change that most people like comes from a vending machine. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, this is true. But, but change is going to be constant. There mm -hmm. is going to be change. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the changes that we could see in production agriculture yes. with millennials. Mm -hmm. How many people, and, and tell me about some of your, your friends who mm -hmm. are interested in being an agricultural producer. Mm -hmm. I think that the face of the agriculture producer will change in the way that they manage their time, money, and resources. Um, mm -hmm. I believe millennials that are my age are more interested in researching, again, kind of that same aspect where consumers are researching more where their food comes from. Millennials my age are thinking, okay, how can I be the most efficient? Maybe it's apps on their phone for better record keeping. Maybe it's attending a lot of the seminars that Extension or Farm Credit um, are hosting so that they can get a better idea. But I think millennials are a learning generation and they're gonna be mm. constantly trying to stay ahead of the curve to make sure that they're up to date with the highest technology that they can utilize. We're talking with Morgan Slave and Morgan, what can and we, people in my generation, and again, I am the age of the average Virginia farmer, 58 years old, what can we do to ensure the success that agriculture continues and that those producers are successful? I think the greatest uh, bit of advice I can give on this is to give us a shot. I read an article one time uh, that questioned the commitment of young people to agriculture, and I don't think that, um, that our uh, more mature generation should discount new ideas um, just because they're different from maybe how they have done them in the past. And uh, there's a huge, you know, we're, we're being compared to the baby boomers as far as um, causing change within society and culture. And uh, so I would say give us a shot because we have 
we're looking at the highest interest rates, we're looking at the highest tuition, we're still going to school to become involved in production agriculture, and we're coming out with uh, you know, l less access to capital, less access to land. And uh, it's, a, it's a new time, but give us a shot, we'll make it happen. Well, there certainly is a lot of creativity out mm -hmm. there. I, and matter of fact, I've seen young farmers here in Virginia mm -hmm. who don't even have land. Mm -hmm. They are growing, for instance, salad greens in an old abandoned warehouse. Yes. And it works. Yeah. It works. <laughs> you know, and they're making a profit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my generation would say, well, are they really farmers? Yeah. You don't have to ride a tractor to be a farmer. Exactly. It's oh. not plows, cows, and sows anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, this, this is a very interesting topic, I know, to a lot of our viewers because I think. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that all of our viewers, we want to encourage mm -hmm. the next generation. Yes. We want to make sure that Virginia agriculture continues in the future, and we want to make sure that we're not ever at a point where we're importing mm -hmm. most of our food supply. Exactly. I think most of our viewers would agree with me, and I hope you would agree mm -hmm. with me, mm -hmm. that we want our food to be locally sourced, mm -hmm. if possible, mm -hmm. but certainly within the United States of America and grown by American farmers. Exactly. Obviously, we, we do have to, to import some mm -hmm. things, but uh, not everything. Very interesting conversation, mm -hmm. and I look forward to having you back on the program maybe again in the future, and, mm -hmm. and we'll continue this conversation about millennials and agriculture. We'll be right back. Well, farmers are always paying attention to weeds in the field, but they should also take a look at weeds in the farmhouse lawn. Mark Viet shows us what to look for as we go in the garden. I personally don't mind weeding in a garden, but there are some weeds I really don't like. One of them is the yellow nut sedge, and the other one is Bermuda grass. This is the yellow nut sedge, has a triangular stem. You know why I remember this one? When I would go to visit my grandfather at his home in Tropical Garden in St. Thomas, he would have me weed his gardens and get rid of the nut sedge or yellow nut sedge. And the way we did it is we would dig it and shake the roots out of the soil because there's a problem if you try to pull it. I've got this plant right here in front of me. If you were to come in and pull it, wow, you think, I got that weed out. But really, you did not get the weed out because what you find is if you dig down, you have left all these little shoots, just this little piece, and this little piece right here will create new weeds. So if you pull one, you're left with five. You do it again, then you have five more. So you're really multiplying the yellow nuts edge in the garden. So I guess you could pull it. You can get your suntan and you can get your exercise, but there are other ways of getting rid of nutsedge. Nutsedge really likes wet and moist soil conditions, so if you have a very wet season, you're going to have a lot more nutsedge in the garden. And you can see the nutsedge here right in the lawn with the bright yellow leaves. Some people grow Bermuda grass as a lawn, especially in the warmer climates. But what happens in many of our gardens is it's interspaced throughout our lawn. And if we don't edge our lawn properly, it actually encroaches and gets in our flower gardens. So what do you do? Well, you can go out in the garden and you can just constantly pull it. Or for the Bermuda grass, you can use a product by Bayer Advanced known as Bermuda grass control for lawns always read the label because a lot of these products are just for lawns and you can't really use them around your garden plants. The other thing that you could do is for the sedge, Bonide makes a product known as Sedge Ender and you can spray your yellow nut sedge according to the label directions and it should control it over time. A lot of these weeds are best controlled when they're younger and they're only about six inches in height, but as they get more established, they're much more resistant, and you're probably gonna have to go out in the garden and get your workout. I'm Mark Viette. 
Join me next time in the garden. Our pearl of wisdom this week comes from founding father John Adams, who once said, Old minds are kind of like old horses. You must exercise them if you wish to keep them in work and order. That does it for our show this week. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Jeff Ishy for Virginia Farming. 90 years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, and there's a local Farm Bureau in every county. More information is at vafarmbureau.org. Virginia soybean farmers are hard at work growing soybeans to produce products you use every day. Candles, soaps, even crayons can be made from soybeans. Remember, when you buy soy, you're helping to support American jobs, the economy, and our nation's energy security.